In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. All good teachers know that you have to start in the beginning with the fundamentals before you build on anything else. Because if you don't have the fundamentals right, you won't get anything else right. Two great movies. The first is that great movie as we move into March Madness in basketball is The Hoosiers. If you watch that movie, you know the coach will take them back to the basics, even practicing without a basketball. The other great movie, The Sound of Music, if you remember Maria von Trapp as she began to teach those children how to sing, she sang that great song, Let's Start in the Very Beginning, a very good place to begin. When you read, you begin with when you sing, you begin with do re mi. We all know that when you begin to read, you don't start with that great book, War and Peace, or for you ladies, Pride and Prejudice, but with perhaps a book like Green Eggs and Ham. When you learn math, you don't begin with calculus, but with one plus one. You have to know the fundamentals, and without them, everything else will be wrong. So if you know calculus and are doing a really advanced problem, but get some simple math wrong, it doesn't matter how much, how much else you know, your answer will be wrong. Or if you're building a road or trying to draw a straight line, if you're just a little bit off at the beginning, you're going to be off at the end. You need to get the beginning right, the fundamentals right, the foundation right, or all the rest will be wrong. So Jesus starts with this great teacher of Israel, Nicodemus, at the very beginning. Truly, truly, I say to you, Nicodemus, unless one is born again, or born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Everything starts with birth, the new birth, and goes from there. But Nicodemus doesn't get it. As a good teacher, Jesus repeats his answer, but with a little more information and explanation to Nicodemus's question the second time. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So this new birth is not a physical birth, but one that is done by water and the Spirit. The same Spirit that hovered over the waters of creation at the beginning of physical life, is the same spirit that works through the water at the beginning of spiritual life in its creation. Or in other words, all this is a work of God. Life in all of its form is all the work of God, not our work. So in the beginning, His Word plus water plus his spirit equals life and creation. And still, to this day, it is his word plus his water plus his spirit, which equals new life, new creation. Nicodemus still does not get it. It all sounds so strange to his ears. How can these things be, Jesus? Can a man enter a second time into his mother's womb? Really, Nicodemus, is that the best you got? It's all about the beginning. Nicodemus is thinking about what man does or can do. 
Jesus is talking about what God does and what God has promised. Nicodemus was thinking of how man can get to God. Jesus is talking about how God comes to man. Nicodemus is thinking about works. Jesus is talking about grace and gifts. And so Nicodemus is understandably confused. This is a whole different way of thinking. And it's why so many in our world today are confused. For still today, when it comes to religion and spirituality, many think it's about what we do or can do or have to do. It's about man's free will or man's works or man's decision. But if that's the starting point, or even near the starting point, then the end is going to be very far away from truth. Because that's not the beginning at all. The beginning is always God. Whether it's things physical or things spiritual, the beginning is always God. It's all about God coming down to man. It's all about God's promises. And so in the beginning, after Adam and Eve fell into sin and were afraid of God and hid, God came to them. God called them. And God made a promise of sending a Savior. And then this coming and this calling and this promise were repeated throughout the whole Old Testament. As we heard in the other readings, God came to a man named Abram, or Abraham, who did not know him, worshipped false gods. God called him and made a promise to him of a land and a Savior. And then down throughout the generations to Isaac, and Jacob, and Joshua, and David, and Solomon, God kept coming, kept calling, kept promising. And then one of the best examples, which Jesus gives to Nicodemus, that great teacher of Israel. Remember Nicodemus? The children of Israel who were wandering in the wilderness, God sent fiery serpents so that they would look outside of themselves to God. God told Moses to make a bronze statue, a serpent, and to put it on a pole in the wilderness. And when they were being bitten by those fiery serpents, God told them to look at that serpent. What did the people do, Nicodemus? All they were doing was getting bit and dying. But what happened, Nicodemus? God came. God called. And God promised them healing and life and forgiveness as they looked to that bronze serpent on a pole. Well, that's what's happening now, Nicodemus. Because just as Moses lifted up that serpent in the wilderness, so now a man is going to be lifted up on another pole, the cross, the Son of Man, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. This is the fulfillment of all of that coming, all of that calling, and all of that promising. For God so loved the world in this manner that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So that man who will be lifted up for the life of the world, Nicodemus, that man is the Son of God, coming and calling and fulfilling all promises of God. Look to him and not to yourself for life. But the temptations that we have and the problems that we face, we look inward to ourselves and not to God for our life. 
And Satan is our biggest cheerleader and fan in that. Oh, he doesn't mind anyone having religion or spirituality as long as you are trying to do it by yourself, with your own strength, relying on what you can do. Because he knows that when you rely on yourself, you are his. A dead man. A dead woman. It's kind of like a man who has just had a heart attack and the heart has stopped lying on the table. And those paddles are sitting next to him. He can't reach out to those paddles and give himself life again. It has to come outside of himself. We prayed in our prayer before. O oh God, you see that our, of ourselves we have no strength. That right there in the beginning is the beginning of all spirituality, the foundation. That is repentance. Whatever you are going through in this life, you will need help outside of yourself. You need a Savior. You need forgiveness. You cannot do it. The prayer goes on so that by your mighty power, we may be defended and protected and saved, which is the cross with Jesus on it. Just as Israel looked to the snake on the pole in faith and lived, so look to Jesus on that cross in faith and live, and look to where that man of the cross promises to be with you today. In words, in water, in bread and wine. Now many today like Nicodemus, will ask, how can that be? How can a little water, a few words, and bread and wine be all of that? Which will be your question if your faith has started, started on the wrong trajectory. They will make little sense to us as Jesus' words to Nicodemus. So go back to the fundamentals. It's all God's doing, God's coming, God's calling, God's promising, God's giving, giving faith, giving forgiveness, giving new life from above, that we be born again from above and fed from above. And it's not that we have to go up and get those things that are above. God, as usual and always, always brings them down to us all the way down to the most simplest things in water, in words, and bread and wine. Not very sophisticated, you might think, but even better than a snake on a pole. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Jesus came to save and give life. He came into the world and was lifted up on the tree of the cross that we might live. To be that connection between God and man, between heaven and earth, using the things of earth to give us life in heaven. Yes, even the water and the spirit of holy baptism, the words of holy absolution, the bread and wine that carries his body and blood, Looking to these in faith and receiving them, we are blessed and are given life. We are the children of Abram, but more than that, the children of God. That's the ABCs and the one, two, threes of faith. And even if you're a Christian, well versed in the scriptures and into the calculus of faith, don't forget the basics. Luther called it the catechism. You can never know it well enough, Luther said. It was what God was always teaching us ever knew. Get it wrong, and your calculus will be wrong. Get it right, and even if you never go on to calculus, it's okay. Because eternal life is not graduation, but a gift.
to you from Jesus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds through faith to Christ Jesus, to life everlasting. Amen.